Hi everybody, my name is Kwasi Mensa. With me, Paul Parkinson. You cannot see Paul, but he's behind me. And so we will be presenting you uh, the microservices, data challenges, and solution we've heavy done and the Oracle database. So let me share my screen. There we go. So uh, I do product management for anything Java connecting to the Oracle database. And Paul is dev, transaction processing dev lead in the microservices cloud platform. Here's the agenda. I will discuss the challenge of persisting events and state. I will also discuss the issue with high concurrency, you know, what are the locking techniques and uh, the impact in terms of data consistency. Then Paul will take a significant amount of time to explain to you all the issues and the solutions around the transaction across microservices. Then he will also show you a nice demo which captures all those concepts and put those in perspective. So why is um, persisting events and state a challenge? So first let's look at microservice communication. Microservice uh, uh, communication could be synchronous using REST or gRPC or some other uh, synchronous or communication protocol. Or it could be asynchronous, and this is more what the market and the community at large has been using. You could combine both, you know, you could have front end receiving REST calls, and you can have communication among the other services using asynchronous communication. Anyway, the issue at hand is I'm doing asynchronous communication. This is low scoping. The events are immutable. You cannot change them once you emit them. Uh, it's a message base, it pops up, etc., etc. And there is a notification, there is a broker, and it's commonly known as event sourcing. So let's look at what event sourcing is. Event sourcing means for those not familiar, uh, microservices interact by sourcing events in and out from the event store and they get notified by the service broker. So in this example, in this, in this picture, order service will receive an order from the front end, will make changes to data, will persist uh, the event into the event store. That broker, the event broker will notify interested party, the inventory service is an interested party to register to receive notification from the order service will be notified that there is an event produced by the other service, but it will get the event from the store. The event store is the source of truth. Right. Okay, so what is the problem? Well, the problem is I need to persist my changes to the database, and I also need to persist my changes to the event store, and I want both things to be one single atomic local transaction. It's no two phase coming here, right? So that's the challenge. What are the solutions? Uh, you could use something known as outbox table. Uh, I I discuss more in the next slide, but in a in a summary, in one sentence summary, you have a process which will tail the transaction log, and whenever there is a new transaction you're gonna publish an event to the event store, okay? So we will we look at this in the next one. And then there is this uh, database table as a, a message queue, which is a manual invention of what I will describe later, which is the advanced queuing. The problem with this second approach that I will not elaborate, but just talk right now is that uh, what about the scalability and what about uh, uh, cross uh, microservices, cross database exchange? How are you gonna do that with a table per database or per microservice? How do you deal with that? So the, it's a manual, but it's, it's not easy to, 
to get right. And then there is the advanced queue uh, solution. Outbox solution, this is it. So you get a connection, you make data changes, you make an insert, an update, and delete to the table, to your schema, multiple tables, I presumably. And then you have a pseudo table called the outbox table, where you will insert a pseudo event. So once you've done, you commit, so it's a local commit, but subsequent step, you need a process which will tell the transaction log and then will publish an event from the transaction log to the event store. So the event store is a separate entity and it's like a two steps operation. So this is a little bit complex and it has some impact in terms of scalability and you know mining the transaction log, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Anyway, people can use it, it works. The AQ approach, pardon me, <coughs> the AQ approach is, is like this. The same, trans, the same connection, the same database connection will be used for data operation in, on the tables and also AQ or Q or event operation because AQ is built into the database, okay? But it's not just built into the database as a a, a, a table, no, it, it, it is a, it's an event system. It is an event broker and it can propagate event from one database to the other, assuming the other database also have EQ uh, in, in it. So it, it is a complete event mechanism, but it reside, it's a distributed and reside into the Oracle database. So from the NAQ session, we can get a JDBC connection and do all the database operations. I mean, all the traditional uh, uh, DML and then do the Q operation as well. And then we commit, uh, when we commit, well, AQ we publish the event. So this is simple and it scales well and it is distributed, okay? And uh, we will talk, uh, Paul will talk about it as one of the approach in his demo or in his uh, distributed transaction. And you will see how it plays uh, nicely. The second challenge I want to talk about is the high concurrency. What are the impact in terms of locking on data consistency? So three locking mechanisms that people use, I mean, that uh, it's known in that technologies, okay? Uh, so what is the impact on shared data and data consistency? Uh, so three techniques, pessimistic locking, optimistic locking, and escrow locking. Uh, here we're talking about concurrent access to the same item. You know, for example, I want to purchase the T-shirt by Paul Parkinson, <laughs> so I need to everybody is asking for that t-shirt. So it, in terms of inventory is one item. It has multiple quantities, but it's one item. Okay, so pessimistic locking means as soon as one person or one process or one microservice issue a request to update, I'm gonna place a, a lock. So I'm gonna place a non-shareable lock, an exclusive lock. This force everybody else, or every other processes or microservices to be serialized behind me. It's only when I'm done that they can access the inventory. So it has limited concurrency or scalability, which is not so good for microservices, but it has the benefit of the acid properties, the database acid properties, so there is no dirty ring. Then we have the optimistic locking. So the optimistic locking, the main characteristic are shared locks. So multiple transactions can access the same item at the same time or quasi same time. It depends when they come. And then the actual update is only performed at commit time, at transaction commit time, the actual 
update to the database, to the inventory. So let's, let's look at this. So transaction one issue a request to purchase five items. Uh, we have 10 in database, 10 minus five is okay, but we are not making the change right now. We're not making the update now. So transaction two comes in and say, I want to purchase three items, the same item, and this is this could be going on concurrently because they are shared logs. So we look at the, the inventory, we have 10 minus three, that's okay. Transaction two, make a commit. So this is where the actual update will happen. And you can see that in the database in inventory, we now have seven items. Transaction three comes make a request to purchase five items. Seven minus five, it is okay. Transaction three commits. Now we have two in inventory. When transaction one commit, well, it's too late. It's only, we only have two in, in inventory. So no, can't do it, roll back. So what is the drawback of this? Well, you could have a dirty read and insufficient inventory at commit time will force the older transaction to roll back. The benefit is this concurrency, high concurrency, parallel update on shared data, which is what we do. our goal is to have parallel update on shared data. Okay, so <laughs> could say mission accomplished. <laughs> okay, and the third, um, Locking mechanism is known as escrow locking. People who bought real estate in the US know what escrow means. Anyway, the, the, the mechanism here are shared logs, but we use the journal to allow or reject based on, on what is in the journal. So we make promises and based on the value we have in the journal, not in the database, and same here, the actual update is performed at the transaction coming time. So if we look at the animation here, transaction one, make a request to purchase five items. In the journal, we have 10. This is the beginning. So it's the same value as in the database. So it's 10 minus five. Yes, we can promise transaction one, you'll get five items. So now in the journal, we only have five items. Even though in the database, there are 10. Transaction two comes and makes a request to purchase three items. We look at the journal, five minus three, that's good. So we promise transaction two, you're gonna get two items as you wish. Transaction two commits, and this is where we make the actual update to the database. So it goes from 10 to seven, but in the journal, we still have only two based on all the promises we have made so far. So transaction, three comes and issue a request to purchase five. We said, nope, looking at the journal, not enough, even though there are more in the database. So we force transaction three to roll back. When transaction one who were promised five comes in, he gets its five item. And now in database, we have two in inventory. So the benefit here is high concurrency, parallel update. We could use the journal to implement the compensation if we were in the situation where we have distributed transaction using the saga pattern, but Paul will talk about it, but the journal is a very important mechanism in that situation. Okay, so the difference between escrow locking and the, um, uh, optimistic locking is that in here, the younger transaction will be forced to roll back, whereas in the other case, it's the older transaction. And here we can also use the journal to do compensation in case we are having distributed transaction. Okay, so that's all I have, uh, my part of the presentation. Paul will now uh, talk to you about distributed transaction all the challenges and the solution that we provide. Okay, so I'll see you uh, on the Q&A. Thank you, Kwasi. Uh, distributed transactions across microservices. So uh, on the left side, we have a diagram from the XA specification. And on the right side, we have a, a snippet 
from the Saga specification. So the XA specification and two-phase commit are uh, distributed locking uh, consensus protocols that are, um, you know, have been used for decades in enterprise systems. And uh, although they're not uh, specifically saying this in the specification, uh, notice that the application program is in a single block on the left there, and um, as well as the transaction manager. And the application uh, program is talking to, to multiple resource managers. Uh, that transaction is coordinated by the transaction manager. And most often, the application program is actually in the same process as the transaction manager. So now if you start to look at microservices where the uh, application program is not a single process anymore, it's not a monolith or whatever you want to call it, it's multiple services and each of those services is talking to its own you know, resource manager. What you've done is, is a number of things, but one of the biggest things that's happened is you've obviously introduced more um, network into the um, program, the overall program. And with this network um, and, and you know various other aspects, you can introduce this latency, and that is going to limit what you can do as far as taking advantages of a microservice cloud environment. It's going to limit your uh, scaling and through throughput and things like that, and may even result in such a slowdown that you'll start to get you know uh, locks held in doubt type errors. And so while it's not prohibited uh, to run such applications in the cloud and such, um, you know, the application server web logic has done this very successfully. It's, um, it's, you won't, as I say, be able to take care, advantage of some of the scaling and other aspects of microservices. So it's, um, it, it's, that's where you kind of draw the line as far as what you're choosing the trade off. Uh, so to to deal with that situation uh the saga pattern which is all it's from the 80s actually um is is being used because it deals with local transactions only so the uh the transaction local between the microservice and uh, its particular resource manager and the locks only exist there in a local transaction not in a distributed transaction um, and so in this case, because you don't have the nice uh, asset properties and clean rollback call um, directly on the resource managers, you need to come up with a compensating action for each of the actions you take. And so that compensating action is going to be a local transaction as well, of course. And I, I think this really kind of sums it up, just this little snippet here that, you know, the desired case is that you continue these trans transactions successfully but if something goes wrong, then you replay their uh, corresponding compensating activities. And of course, that's much easier said than done, but that is you know, the basics of the saga pattern. Uh, real quickly, in case you're not familiar, I just wanted to go over the kind of uh, microservices um, landscape. Uh, at the top, we have larger um, uh, solutions, you know, such as the if you want to call them legacy systems, the application servers and things like that, things that have been coined as monoliths, things like that. You start to move down, Spring Boots is quite large, but you're starting to move more into a microservice uh, area. And then um, a micro profile, uh, which is a set of specifications geared towards writing microservices. And so if you're familiar with Java Enterprise, uh, you know, that's these type of specifications but again, geared towards microservices and then even smaller uh, frameworks than that. And so what we're going to be talking about most today um, is the, a, the micro profile uh, model for writing microservices. So long running actions uh, or LRA is a specification, micro profile specification, and it's used um, if you're familiar again um, with JTA uh, much like the app transaction annotation. So the app LRA annotation uh, is used for two things. One for demarcating a um, transaction boundaries. So it's used to start the transaction. And then it's also used to indicate that a service wants to be a participant in this long running action in this saga. 
And so again, it's similar to the at transaction annotation. What's uh, the big difference between that um, and LRA and sagas is the need to define a compensate and uh, complete methods on our microservices because we no longer have that um, you know, direct rollback against the resource manager. Microservices need to uh, define and write their compensate and complete activities in order to roll back um, uh, any actions in the face of a failure. And uh, as far as the complete case, in case there's any kind of cleanup or um, you know, action that should occur afterwards. Uh, just very quickly about the last three. Forget is when the um, coordinator, and we'll get into the architecture a little bit more in a sequence in a moment. Uh, at forget is uh, a method that is called when the coordinator wants a participant uh, to forget about an LRA, so it can release resources and things like that. At leave is in, in a way sort of the opposite direction. It's a participant saying it wants to leave the LRA activity. And at status is um, a method defined on the participant that the LRA coordinator may call for a number of reasons. For example, if it did not get a, um, a clear response back from a, um, a com compensation call, it will call status to see you know, what the status of that participant is. So this is just very quickly what that looks like in code. Uh, again, um, we have the LRA annotation on a travel agency service up at the top method here. It says requires new, so it, uh, if this method's called, um, it will start an LRA uh, transaction. And then the, uh, the flight and hotel services um, have this similar format on the bottom where uh, the reserve method is called um, and an annotation uh, with LRA type mandatory and therefore that method must be uh, conducted within a, um, the context of an LRA transaction. And, and then finally the compensate complete status methods that I just mentioned. So let me just go through a quick uh, sequence of, of events of, of how this goes. Uh, so you have a, a request to a travel agency app um, and we saw that, you know, that, that book travel method is annotated uh, with the LRA annotation and therefore the underlying LRA library calls the LRA coordinator and says, you know, start an LRA, returns to the travel agency, the travel agency makes an application call to the hotel service to reserve, reserve this, the uh, hotel. Just the way the LRA library and the initiator, the, in the travel agency called start on the LRA coordinator, this hotel service will call join and the LRA coordinator will join this service uh, to the LRA and uh, it will receive the information as far as uh, what the complete method to call, the compensate method to call, et cetera. That will return and then the application uh, response to the travel agency. Same thing for any other services such as the flight service. The travel agency will then, based on the replies from the hotel and flight service, um, indicate whether the LRA was successful or not. Um, and that's generally done you know, implicitly. That will be sent to the LRA coordinator. The LRA coordinator will then issue the uh, complete or compensate method as appropriate on each of the participants that had uh, enlisted, had joined the LRA um, transaction. That, that command is then uh, returns back to the travel agency that returns the, you know, the result to the customer. And so what you just saw was uh, LRA um, uh, using REST. And so that is what is currently defined in the LRA specification. Uh, intentionally, other aspects are not defined yet. Um, so these other uh, features I'm mentioning are, mentioning are Helidon uh, specific. So the Helidon LRA implementation uh, writing has messaging support. We'll see that in the demo, uh, Kafka, and you know any kind of messaging, but of course, if you're using uh, AQ, you're getting the advantages uh, that Kwasi mentioned. Um, LRA with REST and the uh, Oracle DB Saga features Kwasi mentioned. Uh, the fourth 
combination being, you know, messaging with those saga features. And when you use those two together, uh, the logic, there's even more um, logic that's done behind the scenes for you as far as propagating the saga and things and, uh, and things like that. So you can get optimizations and less uh, and simpler coding. And then just various combinations that we have as, as far as what we're building with uh, between LRA with Comunda and the Oracle Process Cloud Service, so uh, business process workflow engines, um, and interop with other languages. So uh, .NET, Python, JavaScript, et cetera, being participants in an LRA activity. So this really is no exaggeration and is actually a very conservative comparison of what a developer faces uh, you know, kind of without these features that we're mentioning. So um, the, the estimate that seems to come back from anyone you talk to, it's um, interesting, is 80% of the uh, development effort in one of these systems that relies on compensating activities goes to that compensating uh, activity logic and the testing and things like that around it. And it, be, it can definitely become a real uh, nightmare and so, especially if you have to do dupe processing, keep journals for all your compensating activities, you know, make sure everything's in order and all of these various uh, aspects. And so, it, you know, it, as it's running off the page on the left here, that's, you know, no exaggeration. And it's no exaggeration that, um, you know, a lot of this is, um, can be simplified, remove all this error prone, uh, you know, lines and lines of code um, by using the features we've been describing. So that's what you see on the right. And so in this example showing uh, held, held on LRA functionality, I have a um, application which involves an LRA uh, that has two participants, an order service and an inventory service. And so uh, the, if an order is placed and the inventory exists, then the LRA is successful um, and complete is called on all the services. Uh, if it is not successful, if there's not enough inventory, uh, then we will have the compensate activity initiated by the LRA coordinator and the compensating methods called on the participants. So I'll be going back and forth between three areas. On the left here, you see the uh, um, terminals for the different services, the front end, order, inventory, and coordinator. On the right, you see the uh, actual front end for the app, and then I'll be popping over um, to show you source code as well. So let me demonstrate the app first. We will um, go ahead and add inventory. So we say, see we have an inventory count of one here, okay? And then these are the various combinations that we have. Um, and we will start by do, using uh, REST communication. And then I'll show you uh, the messaging communication. So we have inventory count. Let's go ahead and place an order. And we will see the order was uh, completed successfully because we did have enough inventory. And so let's look over at our um, terminals here. Hopefully you can see them. Front end is just showing, you know, what we're basically seeing over here. Uh, in the order service, we can see that uh, the order service um, annotation resulted in the LRA um, client there, the library, calling start on the coordinator. Um, and then we can see on the coordinator side that start was called. And, and that the um, order service itself was actually uh, enlisted in the LRA. And we can see the endpoints that were added um, given to the coordinator uh, by the library and the order service, okay? We then um, go ahead and call the inventory service from the order service to see if the inventory exists. We see here that um, the uh, uh, inventory service received the call and because it had the uh, mandatory LRA annotation, it called join LRA on the coordinator so that it now joins this LRA. So we now have the order participant 
and the inventory participant. Uh, the um, inventory existed. Inventory exists is true. That was returned to the order service. And because of that, um, we see inventory success and um, is compensated as false. In other words, complete should be called. That is, uh, or, you know, um, the client calls uh, close or cancel, and that results in um, the close being successful. So it results in complete being called on the participants, uh, and then cancel results in compensate. So in this case, we have close that was received by our coordinator, um, and it went ahead and did a, uh, a, a call to the order service and the inventory services complete methods. Okay, so we saw success there. So then if we go ahead and remove the inventory and do the same thing, we will see the expected failed because the inventory doesn't exist. And then that same flow, you know, we, um, we the, the, it was started um, and the order was, the order service was um, joined into the LRA, the inventory service was joined into the LRA, but this, this time, since there was a failure of the inventory, the inventory didn't exist, uh, we call cancel. And uh, then the coordinator calls the compensate method on the order and inventory service. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the source for that real quick. What we have is the order resource. And again, just as I showed you in the slides, um, we, we see this, you know, requires new that came in um, and then as a result of the successful case, we had complete order called. And in the failed case, we had cancel called. And we did, this is the call from the rest call from the order service to the inventory service. And then, uh, you know, the inventory service received it, checked the inventory, returned accordingly, and then it's cancel or complete inventory methods were called uh, by the coordinator. So that's our, uh, our rest case. Let's go ahead and try this with messaging. So let's uh, do the success case first again. Let's add inventory. But this time we're using messaging. So let's go ahead and place that order. Uh, And so what we can see here is the same, the same process, but we're using messaging. So um, we got the, the start LRA called on the coordinator by the order service when it was started. Um, you can see that it, the start was called here. I'm sorry, the start was called here and the join of the order service for messaging this time. And then when the order service called the inventory service, uh, it you call join on the coordinator. And so we have uh, the inventory messaging resource and then it was successful. So the order service called complete and a message was sent from the LRA coordinator to the participants to complete the order, complete inventory. Okay. And then just the same idea, of course, for the compensate case, we use messaging again, place the order, and this time, uh, you know, we will get back the fact that the inventory does not exist. And so the order service will call cancel. And likewise, the, in the LRA coordinator will call compensate on the two participants by using messaging. Okay, so let's look at the source code for this. So I have the you know order resource and inventory resource, and then there's order uh, messaging resource and inventory messaging resource. So let's look at the order messaging resource, and um, what you will see here uh, is that um, by calling that a message is sent, and we have this uh, incoming order method. So the same LRA annotation, but instead of having you know, um, our rest endpoint here. We are using the micro profile 
messaging specification. So another micro profile uh, specification. And uh, so that order, um, we then send a message. There are a few different ways to do this. In this case, or uh, uh, explicitly sending this message out. Um, the, or the inventory service uh, will then pick that up. because um, it is listening on this order channel. And then it will check for inventory. And depending on that inventory level, um, we'll send a response saying whether the inventory exists or not. So let me back up a little bit on this, on the messaging and uh, explain what's going on here because there are a number of things. So as I mentioned, uh, we're using the micro profile messaging specification and if you're not familiar with that, uh, like a number of other, other things in MicroProfile, um, you have these MicroProfile config properties. And in these properties, you can define connectors in, in the, for the messaging specification to whatever systems, Kafka, AQ, whatever system you may be using. And then you define these channels. Um, and these channel names Again, uh, if you're familiar with MicroProfile, it's a, you know, a standard of the type and a name and then a value for that type that's named this. And so that channel name is what we're seeing in these classes here. So that channel name is order. And so it's listening on a, you can define it any way you like. Um, here we have actually defined cues for each of these but uh, more realistically, you would probably use the same queue and a selector and things like that. But in any case, hopefully you get the, the concept of it. This is what is defined in config as far as your incoming channel, whatever you're listening to. And then likewise, as we're looking at the inventory service, you have your incoming and outgoing. And so this is a very powerful uh, little method here. <laughs> what we're seeing is, um, the order service has uh, placed a, uh, you know, order placed uh, message. That order placed message is uh, picked up by the inventory service. The inventory service is interested in, you know, orders that are placed. The in so the inventory service picks up that message from the order uh, queue or what, you know, uh, what have you. And it then checks the inventory, as I say, and sends that um, inventory exists or not to the inventory queue. Uh, that inventory queue is being listened by the, to by the order service and that's how the order service uh, you know, knows if the inventory exists or not. So this shows the power of the messaging, uh, micro profile messaging and LRA together. But what you also see in this method is the power of using those together with a queue because we know this was a guaranteed message delivery um, and it's a guaranteed message, you know, both incoming and outgoing. But what is uh, two other aspects that are very interesting is that from the AQ message, we are actually able to get the underlying uh, JDBC connection for that uh, AQ resource. So, the uh, AQ is part of the data database, so it's the same resource manager. And as Kwasi was uh, saying, um, you can therefore conduct messaging and database work in the same local transaction. So we actually have three actions going on in the same transaction here. We're receiving a message about an order, we're checking the inventory, and then we're putting the response as far as whether the inventory exists or not on this inventory queue all in the same transaction. So this is all atomic. So very powerful feature. And you can see how short the, the, you know, the method is here. So very powerful. Um, so it, then from then on, it's, you know, basically the, the, the same as the rest case, as you might imagine. The, the um, order service listens to whether the LRA, uh, the inventory exists or not. And then as a result of that, uh, implicitly, uh, will tell the LRA coordinator to, um, you know, complete or compensate to close or cancel. And then we have the, the incoming methods for both participants for that, which is also in messaging. They receive messages from the coordinator. And so again, 
when that happens, we can get the JWC connection and do whatever work we need if we're using AQ in this case. And so hopefully you get some of the, the concepts of LRA and the power of using um, uh, this Saga support with Helidon and the database. And we'd like to uh, open it up to any questions. One thing we want to mention very quickly is that there is a workshop for uh, data-centric microservices um, that's being held at J4K. But in case you could not make it, you can actually do it on your own. Uh, if you go to this URL, you will see the instructions to do so. And so you can do it at your own pace and uh, you know you can watch the video along with it and things like that if you'd like. So uh, I'm, we're definitely interested in any feedback you have whatsoever and any questions. And I really appreciate your time. Thank you.